Let's take our Bibles. We've been going through the book of Proverbs now for some time. I know when we hit Proverbs 27, you probably think that we're close, but we've been in Proverbs 27 for a while, which is all right. This is taking it verse by verse and uh, asking the Lord to teach us of Christ. That surprises some when you announce your text is in the Old Testament. And they say, what? You're going to be teaching us of Christ? Well, he's the Word. And all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It was Christ's Spirit that revealed this to men so that they could write it. And we have it today to read, but it's for our instruction in righteousness. There's only one righteousness that God has ever accepted or approved, and that's the righteousness of of God that the Lord Jesus Christ came and earned and established. And God, on completion of his work, imputed it to the account of those sinners for whom Christ died. What a blessed truth to know. He said, of all that the Father's given me, I'll not lose anything. I'll raise it up to the last day. So we're, we're talking about a sure Savior, but we're also talking about a satisfied God. It's not by our striving. If it were by our striving, we certainly would be losing and so, Proverbs is the book of wisdom. Wherever you hear the word wisdom or see the word wisdom in the scripture, don't think of your own wisdom. Think of that wisdom which is from above, which is Christ. And that's what Paul said he declared in preaching Christ and him crucified, that is his death, that we preach the wisdom and the power of God. And so the title of this particular study that we're looking at today is called Wisdom in a Fallen World. We remind it over and over again, not only in Scripture, but even in our own experience. It's not so much that the world has fallen out there, but I live in a fallen flesh. And how I need this one who is the very treasure of wisdom and knowledge that he would take a wretched sinner like I am and pay my sin debt and then teach me of himself. That teaching is ongoing in life. This flesh never gets better. If you ever hear somebody telling you, well, you gotta keep working on your flesh, it, I'll tell you, you're battling a false hope. That flesh will beat you every time. Even Paul declared that the things I would do that I do not. And the things I would not do, that I do. That's the light of Christ shining in this heart, teaching us who we are. But what does he say at the end of that chapter in Romans 7? Oh, wretched man. Not that I was. I hear a lot of people talking like they beat sin. They're, 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 they've gotten the victory. And uh, they feel like their flesh is improving any, every day and they're sinning less and less. Those folk are deceived. Even John wrote that in his epistle. If any man say that he has no sin, he lies, and the truth is not in him. I'll tell you, that takes out a lot of people that profess to be the Lord's, and yet if they don't even see themselves as they are before a holy God as sinners, then they've never been taught of Christ. I know it's a strong statement to make, but it's what the Scripture says that the truth is not in them. Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am, he asked that question, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And the way that, that language is used back in the day, the Romans would hook two prisoners up together. And they had to, when they one moved, the other had to move. But if one of those prisoners died, guess what? They didn't come right in and take the, cuffs off of the, the dead man, many times they had to drag that dead body around until it was the, the guards or the, the soldiers that determined, okay, we're going to get this body off of him. That's the language Paul was using as one who had been redeemed and justified and taught of the Spirit, that the more the Lord taught him of Christ, the more he saw himself as nothing but dragging around a dead body. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? What do you say? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. And that's our hope. 
It's not always going to be this way. There's coming a time when this flesh will die. It will be put in the ground. That's the only way it's going to be dead is when they put us in the ground. But what hope we have that if the Lord has paid our debt, we ought to be free from this body of death and to be able to, for eternity, without thought of sin or tears, for eternity, worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's our wisdom. But we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen flesh. And I believe that's why these Proverbs are written for our understanding. Nobody can understand these. You could look at them in a natural way, but nobody can understand these apart from the Spirit of Christ teaching us who we are. And it's like anything you find in Scripture. If there's a commandment, there's a problem. But the commandment is designed to show us just how sinful we are. That's why the law was given. There's nobody that could say, well, that's the law, I'm going to follow it. There's none that can. But the, the reason why the Lord gives this law, and we read this here even in the Old Testament, is for our learning. That as long as we're in this life, we're going to face a fallen world, not only out there, but what's in here. Now, in the bulletin, I put my text being from verse 14 down to verse 27. But as the Lord directs, we'll get as far as we can today. But let's read the entire portion, 14 to 27, then we'll have a word of prayer. It says here in verse 14, He that blesseth his friend with a loud voice, rising early in the morning, it shall be counted a curse to him. A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Whosoever hideth her, hideth the wind, and the ointment of his right hand, which bereath itself. Iron sharpeth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Whoso keepeth the fig tree, shall eat the fruit thereof. So he that waiteth on his master shall be honored. As in Water, face, answereth to face, so the heart of man to man. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. As the fining pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. Though thou shouldst bray a fool in a mortar among wheat and, and with, with a pestle, Yet will not his foolishness depart from him. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks, and look well to thy herds. For riches are not forever. And doth the crown endure to every generation? The hay appeareth, and the tender grass showeth itself, and herbs of the mountains are gathered. The lands are for thy clothing, and the goats are the price of the field. And thou shalt have goats, goats milk, enough for thy food, for the food of thy household, and for the maintenance, for thy maidens. Gracious Father, as we read your word, we confess that there's much more here than we could ever perceive or know, apart from your spirit, opening our eyes, the eyes of our understanding, and to see two things. One, just how needy we are as sinners, but also, secondly, just how great you are as God and Savior, your people. And so I pray that you would teach us as we look at some of these verses in this time allotted, and we pray that, above all, the revelation of Christ in our hearts would be according to your blessing, and that we would find in him all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And we're mindful to give you the praise, honor, and glory in his precious name. Amen. So we come back here to Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 14. When it says here, he that blesseth his friend with a loud voice, rising early in the morning, it shall be counted a curse to him. When I was growing up, I was always taught that not everybody's on the same 
timetable. And so there was some kind of practical thing here that if you're up and you're an early morning person, just be careful not to go around and, and be yelling like everybody else ought to be up. That's just a natural way of reading the scriptures and has nothing to do with what's written here. Actually, when it says there, he that blesseth his friend, that word to bless means to praise. So this is somebody that's your friend and you're flattering them. And so it goes against even what the scripture says that we're not to put any confidence even in the closest friend or praise them above measure. And so that's what the warning is here. Be, be careful because it says he that blesses his friend with a loud voice. In other words, you can't say enough good about it. And you're always talking about this person. I fear that there are many that are taken up with preachers this way. They can't say enough good about them. And every time you talk, have you heard so-and-so? And in this day and age, it's easy for them to give you a link. And I just had this happen to me this week. Some guy was all over me, wanting me to know about his preacher. This guy is a worldwide preacher. And do you know anything about him? I was glad to tell him I didn't. But that wasn't enough for him. He couldn't stop praising him. And when I finally asked him, I said, well, what is his message? Because it's by their message, you'll know. And it was as if he'd been struck like a deer in a headlight. He paused. He never thought about that. And the only answer he could give me, was, well, he's on fire. Well, actually, the devil's on fire. So that is no evidence at all that he's the Lord's. What came out of the conversation, he gave me his contact information. As the Lord directs, I intend to follow up with him. If he's one of the Lord's, it may be that the Lord would be pleased with that encounter to draw him. But we're not to flatter men. We're not to praise men. And I would say even for myself, do not in any way endeavor to Praise me, no matter how many years I've been preaching for you or how clear the message has been. Give the glory to God. That is who is worthy of praise. Because it says here, it shall be counted a curse to him. People are going to disappoint you. I don't care if it's the, the best in the world that you could ever imagine. They're sinners. Just like any one of us. And so to praise them above measure, this is what the Lord even said to his disciples, don't think of yourself higher than what you ought to think. Think soberly. And think prayerfully. Yes, we can thank the Lord for different ones that he's put in our path, even ones who are his, but any who are the Lord's, if you bless them, in this sense, praise them and want to exalt them above measure. That's called robbery. You're robbing God of his glory. Think of what the Lord wrote about that servant that after he had done all that his master had told him to do, the only answer he could give is he was the most unworthy servant. That's the answer that any of us have. Not praising men, and that's the problem with the message, popular messages being preached today. It is a message that praises men. I don't care you go into some of these congregations and they're counting heads. And then they want people to stand up and give a testimony in the middle of a supposed worship service that the purpose is to worship Christ, but men love to praise themselves. They love to talk about others how many they've witnessed to, how much money they're giving, and all of these things are nothing but having to focus on that. And when it says here, it shall be counted a curse to him, I'll tell you that unless the Lord is pleased to humble a sinner and teach him of Christ, that curse is eternal. You go to your death resting in, like a lot of people do, when you speak to them about how it is they believe they're the Lord, they'll go back to a man. So-and-so was preaching, and I just couldn't stay in my seat. And 
when he invited us to come down front, I was the first to run down there, and I'm so thankful for him. All of their hopes based on a man and a decision. Well, that certainly can only end up in a curse. And that's the difference, if you want to know the difference between the gospel and the false message, is that itself, in itself, who gets the praise? Unless God, through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is being praised, it is a false gospel. It's part of that. There's no hope in putting your trust in men. So this is what it warns. Be, be warned. Any that would praise a friend, praise a man, someone in the flesh, and do it with a loud voice. You would run into people like I do. They're just, they want you to, did you read the latest what this preacher wrote? And have you heard this latest message from this preacher? So they're like goats just going from place to place, chewing on tin cans and another rubbish. That's what goats do. But never having been taught of Christ, their praise is toward man. And even our Lord Jesus Christ, if you look over with me in John chapter 5, he did not even seek the praise of man. You see, the... Jesus that is being preached today, little J-E-S-U-S. -S. There is another Jesus. There's another gospel. It's not the gospel. But that Jesus that is being preached is one who seeks men's favor. Won't you please give your life to Jesus? And if you do, you'll not only make him happy, but you'll be happy. How many times have we heard that type of message? And it's false. Here in John chapter 5, the Lord was confronting those of his day with this very message. He said, look in verse 41, I receive not honor from men. In fact, in John chapter 2, even before this, there, there are a number of scriptures we can look at together here, but in John chapter 2, when all the multitudes were following him, he didn't turn his head. He didn't come to seek man's favor. He knows those for whom the Father sent him. But here in John chapter 2 and verse 23, and we'll come back here to John 5 in a minute, it says in verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name. There's a subtle little word there. Not on his name. In other words, that they were resting on him, but in his name, as if they knew him. And it says specifically when they saw the miracles which he did. So that tells you right there the motive for which they were following him. It wasn't him, but it was the miracles. And notice verse 24. Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Why? Because he knew all men. He knows the heart. And he knows what's in the heart. It's nothing but sin and depravity. And so he's not going to be moved either by men's flattery or their frowns. It says here, needed not any should testify of man, for he knew what is in man. He knew what is in man and that there's nothing but sin, depravity. But that's what men see. They think by flattering him that somehow he's going to return in kind. The Lord didn't do that. In fact, the Lord, you read through the scriptures, had nothing good to say about any who were self-righteous in their religion. But he had always a word of grace toward those that he taught were sinners before him. That's his spirit that works. But come back here to John chapter 5. Because he continues to address this group that praises men. Gets up early in the morning to do it. Praising themselves. I found that a lot of people will give a, a testimony of somehow something that was done. And they'll paste on it the name of Jesus as if they're giving him the glory. But in reality, the true motive is I need people to hear what I've been doing. That's what this proverb is addressing. 
that any sort of praise of man in any way in life or in worship has nothing but a curse to follow. And the Lord says this here in verse 42 of John 5. I know you. And he says it very specifically because words mean something. Had some trying to defend others. Oh, well, you know what they mean. Yeah, I know what they mean because it came out of their lips. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Here it says specifically, I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. Now that can mean that you do not have a love for God in you, but also it can mean that you have not God's love toward you in you. This is what gets people upset. They want to praise man and, and they want to have man making the decision. And yet the scriptures say, God said, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. And people are appalled. Oh, no, God wouldn't hate a sinner. We don't have any trouble. We that are the Lord's understand how God hates sinners. But we do wonder how is it that he could love a sinner like me. Well, the only way is in that eternal love whereby he purposed to save us through the work of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You have not the love of God in you. He said, I am come in my Father's name and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, ye will receive. So that's, again, the flatter of men. They come in their own name and boy, they've got a long list of Successes behind their name. They like to patch on different degrees behind their name so men will respect them. Dr. So and so. But all that's nothing but a curse. What did Paul call himself? A servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was knowledgeable. It wasn't that he couldn't go in and take on other men in, in debates, but he, he refused. He said, I determined right into the Corinthians, not to know anything among you, said Jesus Christ being crucified. To the world, that's a message that, what good is that? That's, the Greeks love wisdom, that's what he said. And you think you can see, just see these bearded wonders, you know, just sitting around discussing their doctrines. And uh, the Jews seek a sign. Boy, that, we have the same thing today, the two extremes. but. He said, I determined not to know anything among you, said Jesus Christ, and crucified. How can ye believe? Verse 44. So this is the curse, because as long as men are praising men, giving glory to men, even down to man's will, people don't see that as a curse when they preach man's decision or man's will, but it's a curse, because it's an indication that they're still in darkness. Just like the Lord says here, how can ye believe? Faith isn't something that we drum up in ourselves. This is a gift of God. And so any that demonstrate by their words and their actions, giving glory and honor to man and not to Christ alone, it's an evidence that they do not believe. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God alone. The only one that God has ever honored and exalted and glorified is his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And those that he has given him as their savior and their redeemer. And so coming back here to Proverbs 27, you can see how understanding scripture in their context, it's not some trite little thing of shh, still sleep and not everybody's in one person so don't raise your voice <clears throat> those are people will draw stuff out of scripture like that and try to apply it it's just it's nauseating because it has nothing to do with the true meaning of it and so we move to verses 15 and 16 and again all of this is in the same context of our depravity before the Lord but also our need of Christ to be our wisdom. Here's an example given, a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Now be careful, because a lot of times when you hear that, you're thinking of so-and-so, or thinking of so-and-so, and thinking how this is gonna to apply to that or whatnot. But 
These Proverbs are given us to teach us something of ourself. When you hear, when it speaks of a continual dropping on a very rainy day, some of us have lived that experience of a leaky roof and you've got a bucket, you put it under the lake and you might lay down and all you hear is boom, boom, boom. It's nerve wracking. And the problem is the leaky roof. And you could apply it here in the sense of a contentious woman. I've heard marriage seminars on this, how, how to work with a, a wife or a spouse that isn't always agreeable. And so that's the direction that this goes. And it says there in verse 16, whosoever hideth her, in other words, pretending like it's not a problem, it, it's not there, and the ointment of his right hand, this is like somebody that's got some perfume that is in the right hand, and if you squeeze it, the odor comes out. You can't hide it. It says, which berayeth itself, it's gonna betray what you're trying to hide. There's two ways of looking at this, who this woman is here. Number one, we know that Christ's bride is described as a woman. And when you consider who we are as sinners, even the bride of Christ, we're nothing better than a contentious woman. That's what it, we are by nature. And if we try to hide that, it's like trying to hide the wind. You can't. You can't grab the wind and restrain it and hold it. It's going to blow. Or even perfume. If someone pops open a little perfume bottle, everybody notices you can't hide it. The odor goes out and they're like, okay, who's wearing that perfume? You see the lesson here? This is one of them that even though we are Christ's bride, we're nothing better than a contentious woman. And we live it day in and day out. I know that people like to think better of themselves than they are, but like this perfume, it's going to come out. It'll be revealed. But stop and think of just how gracious and merciful Christ is as the husband of his church. That there's never anything, no matter how contentious we are in our spirit, we're not called upon to hide it, but to confess it. And that's what we do daily, knowing ourselves by his spirit, who we are. To try to hide it would be deceptive, would be hypocritical for me in any way to cause, cause anybody to think that I'm any better than anybody else. And particularly to think that somehow God chose me because he saw something good in me. Just think of that drip. Drip, drip. That's our sin. That's our nature. And so that's the second way of looking at this is that this woman that's being described here is who we are by nature. This flesh, it's not going to get better. And you can try to deny it. You can try to hide it. But it's going to come out on you. I saw this week about a couple that was on their honeymoon. And they got caught up on the ship with this coronavirus that's been going around. And so they've been quarantined. And one of the journalists that was interviewing them, they were doing FaceTime. They've been in quarantine now, I think, for 13 days. Can't go out of their room. This is their honeymoon. And uh, both of them said laughingly, well, we've really gotten to know each other now. Well, what it is is two sinners sharing the same space. And I don't care how much a person is in love, the reality is it's two sinners needing the grace of God. And that's the reality of who we are. But the beautiful thing about all that is that it never has changed God's mind. You think about when God chose that people that he purposed to save, he didn't choose them because of any good in them. He chose them as sinners. And you stop and think about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he laid down his life, it wasn't for good folks. 
it was for sinners. And when you consider that when the Spirit of God then, through the preaching of the gospel, is pleased to draw out, separate out one of those that God has chosen and for whom Christ paid the debt, he's not drawing out somebody that's figured it out and finally got things right. It's a sinner. Just as much as this contentious woman. And if you don't believe you're this contentious woman, the next time you complain about the weather, who is it that directs the weather? The next time that you've made your plans for today, but now all of a sudden the Lord turns in another way. And you complain. Even if you try to hide it, like it says here, whosoever hideth her, it's like hiding the wind. Even though you don't speak it, it's still going on in the heart. And so, who is it that can say, this is not me? But if I was loved in my sin from eternity and given to Christ that he should pay that sin debt, and the Spirit called me while I was yet in darkness, for what sin will God ever cast me off? Think about it. The modern solution is divorce. Just get rid of her. And we'll try another. But that's not God's direction solution. His is to be loved with that everlasting love. We'll go to our grave being this contentious woman. And yet to be loved unconditionally. That's the work of Christ. Look in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. We'll probably not get much further than this. That's all right. Take it slowly and look at it as the Lord teaches us. But oh, how merciful. Oh, how merciful. Here in Romans chapter 5. Notice in verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died, not for the goodly. Your Bible says that. Now it says the ungodly. That's who he came to save, the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. He's talking about in human terms. If you find somebody good, you might throw yourself in a way of danger and, and lay down your life for them. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die, but God commendeth his love toward us. He shows his love for us. That contentious woman. And that while we were what? Yet sinners. Christ died for us. So look at the digression or the progression downward here. In verse 6, ungodly. That's that contentious woman. Sinners. But even goes further here much more than being now justified. What is our justification before God? It's not cleaning ourselves up. That justification is by his blood. That when that blood was shed, God once for all imputed the righteousness that Christ worked out to his spiritual account of every one of his elect, every one that he sees as Christ's bride, but nonetheless a contentious woman. So we are. We wouldn't even believe were it not for the Spirit of God teaching us of Christ and drawing us to him. And it says we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were, here it is, we saw ungodly, we saw the word sinners. Here it says when we were enemies. That's what we are by nature, rebels. When you talk about a contentious woman, it's a rebellious woman. You can't hide that. But we were reconciled to God. It doesn't say we shall be. We were reconciled to God. How? By the death of his son. Do you, you realize why it's so vital then to hear of Christ in crucified? Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. He ever lives to intercede on our behalf. That's a, such a beautiful truth when you think about it, that when Christ bore our sin, not even our sin could hold him in that grave because he put it away. And when he was raised again, it says that he, he was delivered for our offenses. That's all we are is offensive. It's like that dripping, constant dripping. And yet, he 
he was delivered for our offenses, but it also says he was raised for or because of our justification. When he was raised, that justification was complete. And now he ever liveth to intercede on our behalf. So we have nothing good to say about ourselves, but in God's view, that's the amazing thing. He should look upon us in his son. And as far as the east is far from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from him. Try setting off walking east. If you could, just keep going, keep going. You'd never meet west. It's just always going to be east. As far as east is from the west, so far as the Lord removed our transgressions from him. So I stand before you today as a justified sinner. I'm not, uh, if you want to look in this heart, and see what's in there. I'm that contentious woman. So what's my hope of glory? What's my hope of salvation? It's in the one who's that faithful husband, that faithful redeemer, that faithful savior, that faithful justifier. And what a blessing to rest in him. All right. <laughs>